everyone. I'm Nissan Laria, co-founder and CEO of Wazer. And so for this, I'll tell you a little bit about what our product is and then a little bit about the journey of how we got there. So at Wazer, we like to make things. We all, stu we all studied together at the University of Pennsylvania uh, on the engineering team. We used to build race cars each year and race them in an international college competition. So there's a lot that goes into making one of these cars, but I want to talk to you about this, a simple metal bracket. Looks basic, but it actually gets welded to the frame of the car and holds a critical component in place. And even though this part may look simple, the process of making it is actually quite involved. You have to trace out the shape on a sheet of metal, drill the hole, bandsaw, or grind the outer profile and then smooth out the edges with a sander or a file. The whole process could take a few hours and we had to make dozens of these things. So you might say, hold on, it's 2019, I have a digital design, surely there's some product out there that'll just make this for me. But it turns out that it's not so simple. So we took a look at the landscape of desktop manufacturing equipment that was available. And as you guys kn probably know, there are laser cutters, which are great for cutting flat sheets of material, but only soft materials like wood and plastic. 3D printers are great for complex shapes, but again, only in plastic. CNC machines can cut some hard materials, but the process is cumbersome and takes a lot of expertise to get it to work. And if you want to cut something hard and flat, you pretty much have to do it by hand. And that's what we're solving with Wazer. It's a desktop size water jet cutter, and it makes detailed, intricate cuts in sheets of any material, cuts through aluminum and steel, but also glass and carbon fiber, ceramic tile, high-end blade steel. And we made the product available and for uh, every workshop. So it's a desktop machine that cuts every material. It's compact and contained, and it uh, has digital precision. So you take your design that you have on the computer, and you send it to the machine, and it'll cut out that path using pressurized water mixed with abrasive particles. So that's what we do at Wazer. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story of how I got here. And for me, it started out in high school. And so I, my first sort of foray into making things was making a 20-foot tall trebuchet and entering it into the Pumpkin Chunkin, which is an annual pumpkin throwing competition in Delaware. And so me and a couple buddies of mine, we made this machine. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we we hoisted 800 pounds of counterweight to throw a four pound pumpkin about 600 feet. Yeah, 600 feet, which is like almost two football fields. So that's us with the machine. And it was good, good enough for third place. So that sort of led me to say, okay, yeah, I should probably go to engineering school. So I went to engineering school, and that's where I did the race car competition. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in the machine shop, so I naturally gravitated towards all the design and manufacturing courses. Uh, so for my senior design project, I was part of a team where we said, hey, Penn Engineering doesn't have a water jet cutter. They don't have an ability to cut sheet metal. Let's try to build a small-scale water jet for the university. And so that's what we did, and that was the original prototype, and that was back in 2012. Then we all graduated, and I always felt that there was an opportunity here that, you know, if our engineering school had a need for this machine, that probably others did as well, but I wanted to get some work experience first as an engineer. So it, it was only three years later that I partnered back up with my co-founder, who is also from Penn Engineering, and we sort of revived the old prototype and investigated whether it made sense to do this 
as a company, as a business. And so we were researching in my parents' basement. We were testing in my parents' backyard. And we said, okay, yeah, there's an opportunity here. We believe it enough to at least take it to the next stage. So, but we didn't have any, we didn't have any business expertise. We, we wanted some experienced advice. So we Googled hardware accelerators and we figured that would be a good place. We also didn't have any money. So we ended up joining Hacks Accelerator. So for those of you who don't know, Hacks is one of the largest hardware accelerators in the world. And what they do is they bring hardware startups from all over the world to their headquarters in southern China to introduce the companies to the vast manufacturing ecosystem that exists there. Uh, and so, and, and this, this, Hacks is part of a larger uh, venture capital firm called SOSV, an American firm. So it, it's not actually... Um, so they have they run a, a series of heart of accelerators in, in various industries around the world. So we packed our bags and we brought the prototype to China. And we this was really valuable for us for a number of reasons. First of all, we were able to work alongside dozens of other hardware startups and the cross-pollination of ideas. We also got access to uh, you know, capital and expertise. Um, but this is where we did the actual product development. So we came with the old prototype. Um, and so now what I want to talk to you guys a little bit about is our design process. And so this is a process that we use to design the entire machine. But since then, it actually has become a decision making methodology that we use for any large strategic decisions in the company. And so it's really a three-staged process where we make sure that we identify the need first and then translate it into a requirement and then to a specification. And so what I mean by a need is a fluffy statement that's qualitative and it's unclear what you mean by it. So like the machine needs to be quiet, right? It's we knew the machine needed to be quiet, but we didn't exactly know what that means, so we had to all agree on what that meant. And so we, for whatever reasons, we had the justification, we decided that it meant to be below 85 dB at 24 inches. Okay, great. So now that you have that, then you can go ahead and specify, okay, that means the pump is this model, the motor is this model, this insulation, etc. So, you know, that's just one need, you know, then you could have another need. So the machine needs to be a desktop. We wanted this to be, a, call it a desktop water jet. We wanted it to be a desktop water jet. We wanted it to be accessible. We wanted it to be small scale. What does that mean? Sort of, so we had to define it. We defined it in our case as it needs to be able to sit on a regular size table, a 24 inch deep table. Okay, so that gives us, okay, the legs need to be a certain distance apart. Great. Still could be a giant, tall machine that wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily think of it as a desktop machine, but it could sit on a table. So then we had another requirement. The machine device needs to be comfortable to use. How comfortable? I don't know. You might have a different opinion. We had difference of opinions. We agreed on... Okay, the machine touch points must be at a height of 34 to 43 inches when on a, tall, when a table that's 30 inches tall. Fully specified, you might disagree as to what that is. We have a justification for it, but ultimately it allowed us to then, okay, that sort of drove the specifications uh, for the machine. And so we hunkered down in a meeting room for like four days and you know, built a spreadsheet where we were outlining all of the needs and then agreeing on all of the quantitative requirements, which are solution independent, before we started designing the machine. And it led to a lot of efficiencies and uh, prevented a lot of conversations, disagreements down the road. So just so you guys have a sense, this is what the product development phases looked like. We 
first had feature level proof of concepts. So we had a machine where we, we proved out the gantry, the motion system separately, the abrasive delivery system, the abrasive removal system. Then we had feature integration. So we would, we, you know, combined all of those features into a machine, a one single device. It was roughly the size that we wanted it to be. And then we had to layer on top the industrial design, you know, what the machine is going to look like on the outside. So the integration of the design model and the engineering model. And that's what we came up with here. So this was the fifth prototype. And this is what we launched on Kickstarter with. It was a works like, looks like prototype, but not manufacturable at scale. So we, and we launched on Kickstarter. We had a, a lot of interest, more than we expected. We uh, had, we did 1.3 million in pre-order. So there was a lot of people that wanted this machine, which was great. Um. Welcome to the Wazer YouTube channel, where we see what weird things we can cut through. In honor of the 4th of July, we're gonna cut through stick. What better thing to cut out of a hunk of meat than the map of these United States? Mmm, that's gonna taste like freedom. So that was, that was the Kickstarter. Then we had to figure out, okay, how do we actually make hundreds of these things affordably? And so that was the design for manufacturing process. Uh, running out of time here, so I'm going to skip through this quickly. But essentially, what we, a, tri a typical hardware company has a relationship with one primary supplier in China, the contract manufacturer that then owns the relationships with all of the, the sub-suppliers. Uh, and we ended up going direct to the living in China for 18 months with our engineering team actually visiting the factories and having direct relationships with all of our vendors. So we would be in conversation, we would visit the factories, we would we essentially design the product in communication with our suppliers, uh, you know, along the way. And we, you know, could get samples, and this way we could iterate very quickly and design, uh, you know, de design a product that with manufacturing in mind. Um, and then we ended up having we have our own facility in China where all of our vendors ship the components to, and when we do inspection, so you could see there we do inspection and packaging ourselves, and then we box up a full container, and then we ship it to ourselves. So we have our Brooklyn facility uh, where we do the final assembly. And so that's a, a facility that we set up. And so we, so we have probably around 100 vendors that we buy parts from. We do all the inspection in China, and then we do all the final assembly, testing, boxing up, and fulfillment from our headquarters in Brooklyn. And so we, you can see we have these like custom made assembly stations that you know are specific to certain operations and uh, parts of the machine. So uh, it's we have a lot of control over the manufacturing process that way. Uh, and then just to finish off, so in terms of timeline, you know it wasn't what we thought it would be. So from product development you know from the begin beginning to to kickstarter launch was 8 months develop product design for manufacture and assembly and production 21 months so way you might think it's the opposite but it's actually for us it, and probably in many cases way way harder to do the production so far we've shipped over 450 machines uh, and we continue to build new ones every day thank you Awesome, thank you. Great chat, great talk. Uh, quick question for me: um, Why, why do you think this hadn't been created before? Was there a technological advancement that you guys capitalized on 
that had come about during the, the building of this? Yeah, it's a, it's a question we asked ourselves a lot in the beginning. And so, first of all, so desktop 3D printing is only around for 10 or so years, you know, with MakerBot in 2009. Uh, and relatively, so, you know, it only, it was only a question of whether this could or should exist, you know, maybe five years ago. And, you know, the complexity of a water jet relative to a 3D printer, it's way, way more complex. You know, 3D printer, at least the, the FDMs are, you know, they're essentially a hot glue gun attached to a robot, you know, whereas the water jet has electro, electro mechanical systems, pneumatics, hydraulics, kind of all in one. And so nobody had kind of thought through and redesigned the machine you know, with uh, affordability and compactness and usability in mind. Awesome, thank you. Questions from the audience? Why did you decide to uh, do the final assembly in Brooklyn rather than doing it in China? So we wanted to be able to have more control, control over the process uh, or the definition of that process and then be able to make changes quickly. So when we had a container, the first container of production goods land, it took us probably another eight months or so before we were able to you know, produce at scale because we needed to make sure that the manufact the assembly process was correct. We needed to make adjustments to the components. And so we wanted our engineering team to transition back to the States and build a company in the States. And so we wanted our engineers to be the ones designing uh, the production line. Hi. Uh, why did you choose to go with Kickstarter? And isn't that limiting yourself in terms of production and distribution? We chose to do it uh, as a launch platform, uh, first of all, for the, the, the marketing benefit of it. And uh, we were running a lean operation, so this was pre-funding. You know, we just had the accelerator funding, so we actually relied on the Kickstarter funds that came in, so that funded the company for you know, the next year or so prior to taking on investment. So it, it was really beneficial for us and it was also a signal that there was, you know, an opportunity here before we had a product ready to ship. So in terms of the requirements, did you take maintenance into account and would someone be able to maintain this machine by themselves? Yeah, we, we did. I, I don't remember exactly what we ended up with, uh, but we definitely have requirements around the machine maintenance, how long it should take to, to maintain the machine or to, to do regular maintenance versus, you know, irregular maintenance. Uh, we, but in general, we knew that the machine needs to be self-serviceable with instructions that we provide, which is what we do. So, you know, because we know that we're not going to be able to sell, send technicians out to service these machines. But what we do is we have really thorough content online, both how-to videos and like very detailed articles with pictures uh, that explain how to service the machine. Given that you're doing custom, customized building in Brooklyn, um, how poised are you for expansion and uh, uh, on greater demand so we it, it, I mean it's not I mean we have a high margin on the product so you know the at this point now that we are in stable production the our, our ability to expand is not limited by our production capacity I mean it would be a matter of essentially getting more space and and doubling the assembly stations and and doubling and training hiring and training new staff and we'd be able to double our production. Awesome. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>